I'll go ahead and say it. Dynamite put me in a good mood last night. Even some of the dumb, stupid crap that managed to find its way on the show that's indicative of the stupid crap they typically do didn't bother me as much as it usually would. But the good that they had on this show, by God, it was really good. And it, it's to the point where I thought the first hour mostly was great. And with one or two notable exceptions within that hour, but it was mostly great. And I worry a little bit that Dynamite this week will be better than the pay-per-view on Sunday. Now you can let me know in the comments whether you agree with that or not. But if you enjoyed this week's show and it's your first time checking out this channel, you should smash the subscribe button and follow the show on Twitter. Let's go ahead and kick it off. Obviously, the big deal for this show on Wednesday night was going to be Shaquille O'Neal. Shaq! Ha! Ah! Was going to be stepping foot inside of an AEW ring. Shaq attack, baby. On TNT. Yeah, teaming with that beautiful, listen, goddess Jade Cargill. Taking on Red Velvet and Fuckboy. Yeah, you heard me right. And you know I'm not lying here. Now, some of you are going to question, well, why didn't this match main event? Why didn't this match at least go on in the one-hour main event? Why did you open the show with it? I actually have no problem with them opening the show with this. I think it was a smart decision in this case. You're assuming that that opening segment is your first interaction with the fans for that week. It's your first chance to get people hooked in. Why make people wait an hour and a half or two to where, especially if you're assuming you're going to pull in some of NBA Twitter to watch it, um, that they're not just going to go watch NBA games, let's say on ESPN on Wednesday night, and not come back to you. So get in, get it on, and get it over with, and accomplish what the hell you want to accomplish with the people that you're really choosing to spotlight here. I absolutely support this decision, and I think it worked out splendidly well for him and really got the show off to an incredibly hot start. Because this tag match was really damn good. There's nothing wrong with celebrity involvement when you're trying to grow your brand and grow your audience, but it is certainly greatly appreciated when it is clear that said celebrities are appreciating the opportunity and what they can bring to the table and are respecting wrestling enough and respectful of the opportunity they're being given or asked to be a part of that they take it seriously, that they give a crap. And it's clear, and it shouldn't surprise anybody, that Shaq gives a crap. We know he's a wrestling fan. We know he's been involved off and on throughout the years, going back to the WCW days of the 90s, WWE. You know, we know he's not coming in here and treating it like a joke. And it certainly showed. Like he got a Shaq knife powerbomb? The spot through the frickin' table? My Shaq took a table spot. That's what everybody was talking about. One of the things out of this match, this match was really laid out well. It really flowed well. Credit to all of them involved. Yes, even Fuckboy. But what I really like about this, I, certainly some of you are going to say, well, you just love the black girl magic. Yes, and your point is what? But they leveraged Shaq in his brand. They leveraged Shaq in his star power to put the shine on who it really should be on. And some of you are going to say it's Cody. It's not Cody. It was Jade and it was Red Velvet. And by God, they seized the spotlight and they made the most out of it. Credit to both of those ladies. And most importantly of all, Cody was the heel here, clearly. He's the one that put Shaq through the table. He's the one that did all the shenanigans. He's the one that's got the Nightmare family and all those other dumb crap. And Shade, Shaq and Jade working as the baby faces like they should have been in this case. But Jade and Red Velvet showed you that they should be two of the women that this division features in the future. Period. If you're looking at four to six women to build this division around, your answers better damn include Jade Cargill and Red Velvet. Period. No discussion. This match showed that Shaq was willing to go out there and do good things to really make this work, and I salute him for it. This match showed that Jade and Red Velvet have something, and you should build upon that as a company. It also showed just how kind of irrelevant in the grand scheme of things Cody is, no matter how much you try to associate him with him like this. Nobody was fucking talking about him. And it also is an indication of just how big of an idiot Kenny Omega has been being in charge of how they booked this women's division. You see evidence of that later on in this show. But here, what they did here, like this is fantastic. What a great way to start the show. 
And then you go right in. It's another match, but it's Pac and Phoenix squashing two jobbers in relatively short order. Great. Not every match needs to be long. Not every match needs to feel or look the damn same. Variety and spice is everything in wrestling. And it worked here to the point where I barely even remember it happened. But it served a key purpose, and I'm hoping all of you saw it. They built in a buffer after that Shaq match. They built in a buffer before they brought out Jericho. That was brilliant. You'll also notice that Jericho pulled his hair back, looked like he dyed it, colored it, and he wore a blazer and kept it closed to hide his gut. Like They're learning their lessons. They wanted to provide enough distance to allow some of NBA Twitter to leave before they started dragging Jericho like the last time that happened. But they're learning their lessons here, so that's good. And this right here with Jericho and MJF, this is a really good promo segment. Like Santana, every time I hear him on the mic, I'm somewhat riveted. Like, he could be a big deal for them. And I want to see him eventually break off on his own and get a bit of a push and see what could happen. He certainly, I think, has the goods. And even the Bucks. Yeah, that's right. Me, captain of the Fuck the Bucks of Suck fan club. Thought the Bucks were really good on the mic. They absolutely were here. Because they're defending Papa Buck. And, you know, they're talking about making this a personal issue. Like you've given them some direction and something they could clearly talk about that resonates, that they could play off of. They were good here. Although I will say, the attack on Papa Buck was 100% justified. He's the one that helped bring those two fuck sticks in the world. So as far as I'm concerned, it was a babyface maneuver by MJF and Jericho. All of this was fine. And what I really would have loved to see was get more heat by having the young bucks get busted open just like their dad by the inner circle. If you really want to generate interest for your match at the pay-per-view, to me, that's how you do it. What you don't do is sit there and do the same typical bucks of suck bullshit that you always do. We can't just make it work on its own. We gotta sit there and do double table spots because we're morons. You don't do that when you just had a table spot featuring Shaq 20 minutes ago, you morons. Like every time it looks like the bucks could figure something out and do something smart and learn sometimes that less is fucking more, they can't help but be the idiots they've been for the past decade plus. And you guys should stop pumping that up and praising that. That was moronic. And it wasn't even incredibly logical to the story. If you want to do those table spots, that works a hell of a lot better at the pay-per-view on Sunday. Do something else to bust somebody open, make somebody bleed, do something like that. Really try to get some heat on somebody. Not just sit there, we're going to do flippy double table spot bullshit. That's stupid. You'll notice, though, it was a go-home show, and all you got was a video package mentioning the champion and the challenger. It shows you just how irrelevant and inconsequential Kenny Omega is as a champion. The real debate is which is worse, Kenny Omega as AEW World Champion or Kenny Omega as Booker of the AEW Women's Division? Talk amongst yourselves. That is a hard decision, because they both suck. Absolutely suck. But, cool with that, the video package was well pieced together, told a good story. Had, what was it, Otani was on there? Like, good shit. And that was all we needed, because you have an irrelevant world champion. And then we get to Jurassic Express versus FTR. Like, obviously, I'm a big raging luchasaurus, Mark. And I've always said, like, you could talk about you're not appealing to kids, but you absolutely are when you're a TV-14 thing. I guess just like back in the day, WWF wasn't appealing to kids. Bullshit. Because you always know that kids want to be older than they are. Kids want to do adult things. So when you do adult things, you're appealing to kids. You think that doesn't make any sense, but it absolutely, if you think about it and think back to your own childhood, makes all the damn sense in the world. However, you can take a guy like Luchasaurus and make him a merch mover for you. You can take a guy like Luchasaurus and make him that top attraction for the younger, younger kids, bringing truly something for everyone. And it frustrates me to hell that he sits there and he hides behind these two fucking jabronis. Like, at least have the other dude that I was talking about so big a couple of weeks ago when he wrestled 
Moxley, I can't even remember his name, and escapes me at the moment, but he looked like a fucking caveman. You want to do a Jurassic Express gimmick, put him with Luchasaurus, get rid of Marco Stunt, then maybe you could keep Jungle Boy. Man, could you imagine how well that would work? But anyways, J.J. Dillon, FTW. Yeah. Looking 55, just like he did 30 years ago, son of a bitch. Not only did you get Tully in his jumpsuit, and yes, this is for Metal B, D, Tully Blanchard, Tully Blanchard. You got a J.J. Dillon appearance. Who had that on their bingo card? The match was cool. Like, I was good with it until we got to the finish. Why the fuck, when you have a tag team with midget-ass Marco Stunt and Jungle Jack Perry, are you having Luchasaurus eat the pin? That is inherently stupid. Stupid. And whoever made this decision deserves to be kicked straight in their dick. But even worse, not only did you have Luchasaurus get pinned, I don't give a fuck that all three of them did the Meltzer drive or whatever the hell you want to call it. It's the fact that you had the 60 plus year old guy, Tully Blanchard, be the one to pin Luchasaurus. Not only are you pinning the wrong guy, you're having the wrong guy pin the wrong guy. Are you really trying to put over Tully Blanchard here? Let's be consistent. When WWE does this shit, you knock them. And in a case like this, you would certainly be merited to do so. We should absolutely 100% do the same damn thing. You don't pin Luchasaurus, you protect Luchasaurus. You put shine on Luchasaurus. If the real story here for including Tully was freaking Marco Stunt, then you had Marco Stunt eat the goddamn pin. That was stupid. Why the bluest of blue fucks are you having Tully Blanchard in his 60s Pinning goddamn Luchasaurus. That's ridiculous. We got our first appearance by Paul White. No more BS. It was his actual shirt. Yes, it was. And his big announcement, not only the commentary piece, which we already knew, but he made the big teaser. That come Sunday, AEW was going to announce that they have a Hall of Fame worthy person, a huge star that they're bringing in. Oh, boy. Let the speculation to begin. Oh my god, CM Punk is finally coming to AEW, the A Monday Night Wars, the Attitude Era, all of it's back. It doesn't even matter anymore. My life is complete because CM Punk is wrestling once again. Or it's going to be speculation. Is it Batista? Is it the world's strongest man, Mark motherfucking Henry? Some of you assholes are going to sit there and assert that it's a certain founder. Don't you do it. Don't you dare do it. Maybe it's somebody like Kurt Angle. I like, it's an interesting thing. Like, they better hope, the way it was pumped up, that they can actually follow up on the goods. Because what you don't want to do is hype up something to be really big, and then it largely goes over like a fart in church. You don't want it to be hyped up as somebody that's Hall of Fame worthy and it feels like a total troll move. Now, if it is Scott Steiner, and you bring him in just to cut promos and give us math and English lessons every week, then God damn it, absolutely is worth every bit of that. There are lots of possibilities here. It's got you, got me at least a little more curious in the pay-per-view on Sunday and who this is going to be. It's fun to speculate. Like, let's not get crazy with them. It's fun to speculate. But they better hope that they're not just trolling everybody or overrating somebody in their minds. I know some of you are going to say, it's better be Okada. It's better be Okada. Oh, Christ almighty. Um, this Women's Eliminator Tournament final. You've got Nyla Rose facing off against Rio, whatever the hell her name is. Instead of having the one Japanese ladies wrestler that actually had some buzz going into this tournament advance or do anything, you eliminated her quickly. I believe it was Rio that eliminated her. So that way you could advance her to this finals and you've advanced Nyla Rose even though you put a lot, it seemed like, behind Dr. Britt Baker. Like, this makes no sense. This is perfect, typical. Kenny Omega is a damn idiot booking the women's division bullshit if you've ever seen it before. This right here, Nyla Rose versus Rio. I'm sorry, this match wasn't very good. It was stupid. I was thinking the whole time about the potential that, of course, Rio's going to win because you might as well take the irrelevant contender and put her up against the irrelevant champion. Like, why is Hikaru Shida even a thing in AEW anymore? She's a champion and she's never on TV and they never do anything with her. This is stupid. Like, you use this tournament to build somebody legitimate. And I know some of you clowns that watch Japanese wrestling probably going to sit there and say, Rio's great, Rio's great. She didn't show it last night. That match was stupid. And the whole premise of this is stupid. 
could have had somebody else win it. Dr. Britt Baker seems like a perfect person you could have went with. And at least if you would have said Nyla Rose, I would say, you know what? You've done it before, so at least you have some certainty there. It doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things because Kenny Omega doesn't know what the fuck he's doing, so it really doesn't matter. You must understand, he is a total clown when it comes to booking this women's division. So, of course, one of his Joshi wrestlers won. So, Rio's going to face off against Hikaru Shida at the pay-per-view, and nobody's going to give a shit. And either way, regardless of who wins or loses, your champion will still be irrelevant, hardly appear on TV, and certainly won't do anything interesting. That's Kenny Omega at his finest. I loved having Ricky Starks come out and confront Sting. You know, Starks is not the biggest guy, which is a knock. It's obvious, you know. But he didn't look too small standing in the ring against Sting. But at the end of the day, I care more about personality and charisma and ability to talk than I do about pure size, no matter what some of you clowns like to think. And Ricky Starks has that, and he has that in abundance. And I thought he did well going toe-to-toe -to -toe here with Sting. Um, this whole kind of fracas, you get Powerhouse Hobbs and Cage coming out, and Darby Allen makes the big save. I think this is cool. Well-executed segment later in the show. See how Sting does at the pay-per-view on Sunday. You had 10 from the Dark Order taking on Max Caster. Uh, the raps are cringe, but hey, it's whatever. It's part of the shtick or the appeal, maybe, I guess. Um, is anybody else starting to think like it's time to start showing ne stop showing negative one all the time? Like, are we getting to a point of exploitation or overutilization? I'm not saying we are totally, but I'm not saying we're not totally either. Like some of you in the comments will probably say, how dare you? You know, he should be able to pursue his dream and be, okay, fine. But some of you might also be like, yeah, you know what? This shit's getting kind of old. It's time to stop showing him on TV every week. Like, this is nice. You know, understand. Maybe you can bring him in at different select times, but it feels like he's starting to exploit the situation a little bit to try and help out the Dark Order. Like, it's a, it's a tough balance, I want to say that. Uh, match was okay. You know, you had the big uh, thing here where Matt Hardy paid somebody, who was it, Jack Evans or somebody, to uh, interfere with 10, like this is all tying into uh, the feud between Hangman or the Dark Order, Matt Hardy, Hangman Page, and the Dark and um, Matt Hardy, which led to the main event. Kind of an interesting choice for the main event. It's Page and Silver uh, taking on Matt Hardy and uh, Mark Quinn. Like, I really don't remember much about this match. I gotta be honest. Like, but at this point in time, it was cool. Like, I really didn't hap care much what happened in the main event because I'm like. Page and Hardy will have their match at the pay-per-view on Sunday. I blew my wad earlier in the night, figuratively and literally, with Jade and Red Velvet in the ring at the same time. <laughs> um, but, at least I'll say this. Most everything that they did on the show directly tied into the pay-per-view. That's good business. They gave you some things, like outside of that opening match, where you say, well, I didn't have anything to do with the pay-per-view at all. Yeah, sure. But, I'll say this, is that, that match was outstanding. That was a lot of fun. That was a great way to start off the show. It created a positive vibe for the rest of it. A lot of the other stuff did tie into the pay-per-view. Like even this 10 versus Max Caster match. This was that, what was that, that ladder match qualifier. You had Scorpio Sakai sounded kind of heelish on the mic, on commentary. Like, yeah, a lot of this worked. Some of it wasn't perfect. Some of it was really stupid. The Bucks of Suck are usually stupid, so not surprised to see them doing stump stupid here, which is a shame because I thought their promo work was actually pretty good this time. Uh, pinning Luchasaurus in that spot and by that person is inexcusable. That's clown school shit. And you would call out a WWE for doing it as you should. And you certainly as hell should be doing that here. There was no purpose, rhyme, or reason for it. Just dumb. Just like the whole women's tournament was dumb just so that way Kenny could sit there and pretend like Rio is a big deal and nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit about her. And the whole women's division that he books is fucking stupid. Because he's stupid, ironically enough. Also a stupid-ass world champion. Arguably your main event of the pay-per-view had very little mention, had very little buzz around it, had very little feature on the show. And perhaps that's appropriate in the way it should be. Um, but I enjoyed Dynamite this week. I really did. You can enjoy things and still criticize things. I want to make that clear. Some of you don't always understand that distinction. You get very sheepish. Like, you have to enjoy everything. No, you don't. Wrestling is not designed to always be great with everything. It doesn't have to be. Like you have some really good and awesome stuff that carries you through the rest of the night. And that's what happens here. I hope AEW delivers with their pay-per-view on Sunday. Otherwise, I want to clown them a little bit for making Dynamite on Wednesday better than the show you're expecting people to pay 40 50 bucks to watch on Sunday.